So I think. Welcome to our panel on digital twins of the oceans. Uh, we have a great panel here this morning. We're going to have uh, three short presentations, maybe 10, 15 minutes each, from myself, uh, Anne, and also John Siron is going to join us online. And then we're going to have two interventions here from Gideon Henderson from the UK and Anne Carroll from Botsol. Thank you very much to the two of you. And for doing impromptu, you know, we it was a little bit of an organizational glitch, but I'm sure given that last panel you were on, which is so relevant to this panel, uh, I think you'll see in a moment why your point. So we see John now here. Welcome, John, uh, from National Oceanographic Center in the UK. So without further ado, let's start right in. So that's me, Martin Visbeck. I work at GEOMA, the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, Germany. We're a partner in the pavilion, very proud. We missed that last year. We're very happy to be here this year. What a great pavilion that is, and also what a great auditorium we have. So it's wonderful to be here one day after Ocean Day at COP, but I think we're still close, right? So digital twins, in some ways, if you want to just a short quote, uh, they combine innovation and information to optimize sustainable development pathways. That is the gist of what we want you to learn about. There'll be some examples on a bit more what's beneath the roof of a digital twin, but maybe also giving you an idea, what is a digital twin, have I ever heard about that? And we're gonna have some great examples from a coral reef uh, uh, example and also hearing what's happening in that space in the UK. So colleagues, I think we are live in a wonderful time, at least throughout my career, the number of ocean observations that we have available to us are much more than then. So on the one hand, I could be very happy to say that we can see many things in the ocean and it's changing almost in real time. But I can also be very unhappy to see when you go zoom into a particular piece of real estate, there's still much more to do. So we're halfway there. The same is true for simulation capabilities for the ocean. When I started as a grad student, the ocean models that I looked at, I frowned at them because they never had anything that I could see in the ocean in the model, even halfway, right? And that has changed dramatically. Uh, ocean models are quite good these days. And in fact, I know of some papers that I've been involved in where we discovered a phenomena in the model, went to sea and found it in the ocean. So that shows you where the state of play is these days. So we have an increasing set of observations. We have better models. And that allowed us to do something which I think is fantastic. So we can take the observations and share the data, use the models, and then to produce knowledge. But the way we do it today, we do it on the digital world. So we take the real ocean and reproduce it in the digital space. And in engineering, they're called that digital twinning. That is a word that is not invented by the ocean science community, that is invented by engineering. The saying is it was part of the Apollo program. The saying is when the lunar lander, they had a digital twin of that. When they asked the cosmonauts to pull a switch, they didn't want to try it on the moon, like in real time. They did it first on the computer and see, would that be a good switch to throw if it was out of the planned mission, right? So that's what they say. Today, digital twins are used for designing cars, airplanes, railway systems. They're hugely popular in cities, city development, but somehow they're not so popular yet in the environment. And that's what we're trying to socialize here. So, um, okay. I am do press the right button. I've been here before. Can my technical team try to see what goes wrong there? Oh, OK. So digital twins are something that is designed by the scientific engineering community, but I think they can be extremely valuable to governments for marine spatial planning. They can help civil society to understand more fully what's happening in the ocean. They are used a lot in the private sector and their interactions with the ocean. And I do think they can play a role in educational activities. Technically speaking, digital twins solve a boundary uh, problem. Boundary problem, they don't solve an initial value problem. The initial value problem is what you do in forecasting. You know what the ocean is today. You take the dynamics for it. We call it a forecast. In twinning, you say, what if I change the boundary condition? If I intervene, what would the ocean do then? So it's not a forecast. It's a scenario generation tool. It's something you optimize interventions. And the most famous digital twin at COP is this one. The question, the what if question is, what would the global temperature look like if you put a certain amount of CO2 into the atmosphere? 
And the way you solve that twin problem is you take an Earth system model in the middle, you put your CO2 emission scenarios in, and then out comes many things, including a global mean temperature. And then you might ask the question, is that a good CO2 emission pathway if it gets to a lot of warmer world, or is a lower one better? So a very typical digital twin problem is not a forecast. It's a what-if scenario. What if we do this or that amount of CO2? And obviously, we're discussing here at COP how we can begin on that green pathway rather than the blue one. But it's a <clears throat> typical digital twin problem. I'm going to explain one a little bit more detail that is more akin or more relevant for our community. That is, if the sea level is rising because of climate change, we know it does. We already have like that much. We're going to get at least this much more, maybe even more. So the question that a coastal community has, including here in Dubai, how are you going to defend or adapt to sea level rise? And there's many options. You can build a dam and dike. That's what my country does. Here, you can think about maybe protecting the corals or maybe even growing more corals with one solution. The Netherlands put sandbars out in front of their dikes because that they can reduce the wave on slot. You can also do nature-based solution like seagrass for that, or you can retreat. So these are just four or five different options for Dubai to deal with climate sea level rise. So the question that your developer in Dubai might have is, what is, works for me? What's my best option? So you take the projections, you regionalize it, localize it down to the city planning level, and then you just see how it plays out at the local scale, your defense mechanism against sea level rise. First thing you want to learn, will it do the trick? So is it effective? Next thing, can I afford it? What's the cost around it? Is it socially acceptable, whatever I want to do? And, and the last thing is, in some ways, is it ethically OK? Right? So there's many dimensions around that that you can play out on the computer, look at full scenarios before you go into the field and implement that. Now, sea level rise is a slow process. It's more about capital investment 20, 30 years into the future. So verification will come slow. You know, so you must do it on the computer. That's the only way you can really future proof that. Wind capture systems are a, a big topic in my country. It's in, a, in, in the UK, a huge topic. In the US, not so much yet. But if you want to plan wind energy from the ocean space, again, you're building digital twin system. And this space is interesting because the industry has digital twins of the wind capture system. That's what they've been doing since 30 years. But they don't have them coupled up to the environment. And they're extremely interested to couple them up because you want to know how closely can I put them? Can I do co-benefits with Maori culture in between or seagrass meadows or kelp? You use them also for CO2 drawdown. But how close can you put them for maintenance issues? What's the risk under storm surges? So there's many interesting factors for them that they use the digital twin technology for to optimize their investments in the ocean. So uh, with my few examples, we're going to hear a few more in a moment. So what will it take to get a digital twin? There's no digital twin without data. That means for a digital twin to become a reality, you need an observing system. So the observing system needs to be fit for the question that you have. So it needs to be specific, tailored maybe to the system that you want to look at. But Carol Ann just said this on this panel before, you know, the question today is sea level, tomorrow it's carbon, the day after that is biodiversity. So we think the observing systems would be generic and specific at the same time, but there must be a compromise. Second of all, I think digital twins can also be used the same approach to optimize our observing system as such, because they're also costly, they also need maintenance, so it's another uh, area around there. So I think there's many opportunities in that space. The next thing is there's no digital twins without advanced ocean models. And the advantage that we're seeing in coastal models is amazing. And I think the breakthrough that will particularly be needed for digital twins is going to become from machine learning and AI. Because you want to run many model runs. So you can't run very expensive models, but you can run a few expensive models, learn from that, build AI versions of that, which might not be 100% accurate, but maybe 90% accurate, but you can run many. And I think that's very clear that trajectory is going. But you also want to couple up your dynamic ocean system with a finance model, with a societal model, with a land-based model. So many of these connections will have to be done through some AI machine learning type of interfaces. And a lot of examples in that space. Very exciting, by the way. Um, I think the hardest part in making digital twins a reality is the data challenge. Data in digital twin lingo, you call it a data lake. I, I always said, can I call it a data ocean? They said, no, you can't. It's a data lake, right? Because that's engineering language. <laughs> so the data lakes need to be trusted. They need to be democratized, meaning we can 
cut across uh, nations. They need to be standardized. They need to be interoperable. Ontologies need to be de developed. This is not easy for our community. Who is setting standards in the ocean community? Not so clear. Atmospheric WMO. For the ocean, maybe IOC, maybe IEEE, maybe ISO. So there's a bit of work to do in that space. IODE is active there. And the last thing which I find exciting is the visualization that will be possible for digital twins and will give us some great examples. At Geomar, we have a, we call it Arena 2. It's a 120 degree dome. It's almost the size of this auditorium. The decision makers sit inside. I call it a decision making theater, right? You play out the future scenarios and you decide which ones you want. In this particular version, they're playing a, a map of the seabed, a decision that they're making about the next expedition to optimize for ship time. So that's a scientific decision-making theater, but you can imagine any other decision-makers coming in. You can do, use uh, 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 the, the goggles for virtual reality. Upstairs by UNEP, you see some of those. Right? Imagine you can look at the futures, all doable. We have all the technology, and people are putting this together. So this is a popular topic as of the last two years. I'm running a program under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development called DITTO. And as part of that, the UK John and so on. And we had the first summit uh, last year, thanks to the G7 initiative from the UK in London. It was a wonderful summit, 70, 80 people there across the sectors. Really great discussion. Gideon was there. Thanks for being there with us then. And we had the last one just a month ago in Xi'an, China. And we had a great ride there, right? It was fantastic. 400 people in the room, 100 from outside of China. I would say 40% early career scientists, a lot of technology. And by the way, folks, China, Tencent, the big electronic company, has open source digital twin software for the ocean available today. So they're doing it, right? They don't wait for us to do some stuff. They're in it, right? So I think we need to be making sure that we can be part of that community and share the technology and the data. So it's been a fantastic meeting uh, a month ago in China. So I'm going to stop right here, just stay in ditto with working groups to advancing that technology. So I think it's an exciting ride. If you like what I'm saying, there's a website. You can join the program, be a partner. And um, with that, we're going to do questions at the end. I want you to learn two more versions of Digital Twins, one from Anne, which I know is super exciting, and then we're going to have John come in from the UK. So thanks for listening, and Anne, over to you. Thank you so much. From a scientific perspective, as a scientist, the fact that a tiny, tiny organism that doesn't have a brain, the size of smaller than your fingernail on your pinky finger, can build vast underwater jungles that can be seen from space, is absolutely fascinating as a scientist. The shock and awe, though, is the fact that thousands of coral reefs spread across 112 tropical countries, taking up less than 1% of the surface ever of the ocean, are supporting the livelihoods of a billion people around the world. That's one-eighth of the global human population. And 25% of all species in the ocean living on coral reef ecosystems, breeding on coral reef ecosystems, finding a safe haven in coral reef ecosystems at some time in their life cycle. That's an incredible achievement for a tiny, tiny creature in the ocean. Unfortunately, we are now witnessing the unprecedented decline of coral reef systems all over the world. It is estimated that we've lost about 50% of live coral reef surface area in the last 40 years, a lot of it due to the combination of climate change, especially the intensification of heat waves and human exploitation of these systems. As I'm standing here today, we have more scientific knowledge than ever before about how coral reef ecosystems work. We have more investment from philanthropy, from governments, in coral reef conservation, coral reef restoration, coral reef management. And we have more political will to turn the state of coral reefs 
around. And just at this conference, while I was at this conference, some of the pronouncements made at this conference, some of, the, some of them outside of this conference, huge new commitments to the conservation management and restoration of coral reef ecosystems. Unfortunately, the probability is high that 99% of those efforts will fail, and the reason is we do not have a plan. Unlike businesses, which project their profits into the future using, using complex models, sophisticated algorithms, and then change their business strategies to ensure those profits, current efforts in coral reef conservation management and restoration don't have those kinds of plans. Consequently, a $100 million investment in bringing back and restoring the Florida Keys, the Iconic Reefs program, we're seeing hearts broken, hopes dashed, because beautiful coral farms set out by sincere, passionate, driven people succumbed to the 2023 heat wave. Everything died. I need the sound there. Cover throughout Florida's coral reef, meaning that we're basically on the brink of functional extinction. And right now, we are in some ways shooting blind. This is Erin Muller. She heads up one of the largest restoration efforts in the United States at Moat Marine Laboratory. She said, we're shooting blind. Our efforts to build the first coral reef digital twin with funding from the National Science Foundation and in collaboration with Siemens Technology Corporation is addressing this gap in our efforts. The goal of the Coral Reef Digital Twin is to provide the stakeholders and decision makers with a way to plan, with a way to conduct what-if scenarios, with a way to adjust their strategies to optimize the outcome and reduce the risk. I want to give you an example and this is where we first started building our coral reef digital twin. I just want to tell you, we're 18 months into this effort. It's brand new. And we're starting in a tiny coral reef atoll in the middle of the remote tropical Pacific. And the reason we started there is because it's tractable. It's a tractable place to start to develop a prototype. This is Palmyra Atoll, and that yellow dot there in the middle of nowhere is where it is. It is a US national fish and wildlife refuge. The only problem is, with our refuge, is that in, the, in World War II, the US military occupying Palmyra at the time built causeways across the lagoon. You can see this one here and connected the outlying islands that reduced the exchange of water between the ocean and the lagoons, and this causeway reduced the exchange of water and larvae across the lagoons. So essentially, the abundance of life in Palmyra's lagoons, which take up the majority of the coral reef ecosystem, nothing there. It's all dead. So the US Fish and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy, which are now charged with bringing back Palmyra to its pristine pre-World War II state, approached us to assist them with a plan. And we built a model, a fine-scale hydrodynamic physics model of Palmyra that's resolved to 50 meters. So each cell is 50 by 50 meters, 16 depth layers, simulating temperatures and velocities and wave heights hourly. 
And in our model, which is essentially a digital twin, we can take out that causeway, or we can pump, uh, uh, take out bits of the causeways. We can take out the connections between the islands and see if that brings the circulation system of Palmyra et al. back to its pristine state, and thus, once again, in a position to support life. So I know the answer to US Fish and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy's question about what do we do. And I want to share with you what that looks like. And I also want to share with you a confession. But I didn't understand that either. I need some very clever engineers to convert that code into nice visualizations for me. And that's what gave me the idea that we need to do this for the stakeholders. This is not enough. Just so you know, it's not just me. We went out to the stakeholders, diversity of coral reef stakeholders, managers, conservationists, fishermen, fisherwomen, aqu aquaculturists and ask why they're not using our data, because we have it, to make better decisions. We can't understand it, says Hannah of, no of Noah. We can't use it to make decisions, it's unactionable. Director of the Marshall Islands Conservation Society. We have a lack of planning tools. This is Helen de Coombs. She is the National Disaster Management Agency Director in the remote Pacific Islands, and she says we often make life and death decisions with no data because we don't understand it, can't access it, can't make it actionable. I'd heard about digital twins, but didn't really take them seriously because it, they haven't really been incorporated into the environmental sphere. But once I started researching digital twins as a potential solution, what I found is vast application across industry, across healthcare. Car manufacturers have been using digital twins for 10, 15 years. Digital replicas of the actual car to both improve its performance and to test out what-if scenarios. So instead of, you know, those videos where they ram in the car with the robot or the model into a wall to see the impact of the, on the human, well, now they don't have to destroy the car in the process. They're actually just doing it in the digital twin. And so we said, well, why don't we build a coral reef digital twin? Why don't we leverage digital twin technology, pull all the data, all the models, all the images into one digitized version provided in an intuitive visual language to a diversity of stakeholders across cultures, across languages, across oceans, via the cloud so that anyone who has a cell phone, anyone who has a desktop can access it and allow the decision makers to conduct what if scenarios, to make a plan, reduce risk, optimize the outcome. So our coral reef digital twin, once it's ready, will be accessible via the web. It'll be intuitive. Data communicated through a common visual language. It'll be interactive with a point and click of your mouth, a touch screen. It'll be actionable. So you can actually conduct what if scenarios within your twin. And critically, Whatever you do in your digital twin is shareable with your managers, with your stakeholders, with your investors. So I want to show you where, you are, where we are in our prototype development. This is me accessing the Palmyra digital twin from the cloud for the very first time. I'm not very good at it. And there are some bugs, so I had to slow down my mouse. My mouse. But this is Palmyra 
without any water. So you're seeing the atoll bathymetry with the lagoons. It looks blurry to me, but is that my eyes? And I can rotate it, and I can zoom in, and I can zoom right in to 50 meters resolution to see the places that I'm interested in. Here, we've superimposed, and, the, and the, the user has the option to superimpose the satellite imagery, the Google Earth satellite imagery, on top of the bathymetry. So now it's actually starting to look like the Palmyra Reef that I know. <coughs> And there's the causeway that we're going to remove in a couple of minutes. And we've teamed up with the Allen Coral Atlas to overlay the coarse scale benthic information. That's the corals, the seagrasses, the rubble, the sand, the coral and algae, on top of the 3D benthic imagery, uh, bathymetry. So you can see the pink is where the corals and the coral and algae are. And you can see in the lagoons that there's absolutely nothing there right now because of those causeways. And then what the user can do is can run a temperature simulation or a velocity or a current flow, wave height, wave energy simulation in the twin. They can choose the time, year, date, hour that they want to see what the temperatures are doing. And because the twin is three-dimensional, they can choose the depth that they're looking at. So here, in this uh, snapshot, you're looking at one meter below the surface in Palmyra. And you can see, I don't know how to use the point here. This portrait right here, you can see the buildup of heat. The buildup of heat just inside the causeway. And that's because the causeway blocks the flow. So there's no exchange of cooler ocean water in there. So the heat just builds up and kills everything in the lagoon. The user can also sit and watch the temperatures in the lagoon changing. Choose any spot on Palmyra, any depth, any day, past, present. We can even project into the future and watch those temperatures change with the press of a button. So now I'm going to show you how the user can conduct a what-if scenario. And I see Martin's watching his phone, so I'm running out of time here. Uh, but where the yellow er uh, arrow is, that's where the causeway is. And I'm showing you a different simulation, different period of time in the life of Palmyra. So the water temperatures, which are shown in color, are slightly different. But you can still see. Right there, the red blob of heat that's building up in the lagoon because the causeway is there. Now, the user can go in and can remove that causeway or parts of the causeway or add a new causeway and see the effect of that intervention or those permutations and combinations of interventions on the circulation in the lagoon. So here we've reduced the heat buildup in the lagoon significantly by taking out the causeway. And if we used our depth slider, we could see that the lagoon is cooled all the way down to the bottom as 80 meters depth. OK, so we've convinced the US military to come in and conduct an intervention, because we can show them now what those interventions will look like. We can reduce their cost. We can optimize the outcome by conducting a number of simulations. So they've removed the causeway. We've, we've uh, gotten the circulation back to its pristine state. The reef is ready for new life to take hold. But it needs a bit of help, because nature's kind of slow. So we want to bring in our restoration techniques. Now, one very important consideration in restoration is where to put those restoration plots, which are expensive and very labor intensive. We want to put them in places where the larvae that are released from those restoration plots are going to stay within the reef system and not be swept out to sea. So what the user can do in the digital twin is choose 
some places run simulations to figure out where's the best places to invest restoration effort. This is a larval dispersal simulation that the user can conduct in the digital twin from wherever they want in the coral reef system. And once we've restored the reef and the reef is starting to come back to life, we can record that with our photogrammetry imagery, and we can upload it into our digital twin and share it with the world. Share the success of our planned interventions with the world. Thank you so much. What a fascinating insights into what digital twins can do for you and imagine your application coming to life. So before we go to questions, we have another short presentation from John Sidon. He's joining us virtually from the UK. So John, I'm very, I know you're there. Now we can also see you. We can, we're gonna get the slide deck back in a moment and you just say next slide, John, and then I think it should be running smoothly. Um, it takes a moment to get to the right place here till your first slide shows up. We still have that great car. It's Dubai, right? The city of cars. Okay, almost there. Yeah, two more. Uh, okay. John, there you are. So we're going to presentation mode. John, over to you. Great to have you here virtually. Morning, Martin, uh, and morning, everyone. Uh, it's slightly strange to see myself reflected back with a two second lag. So hopefully this is working okay. Um, it's a great pleasure. Uh, I, I'm afraid I can't see my slides. So is there any way I can see my slides as well as myself on the screen, please? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So it's a great pleasure to be invited to uh, give a few perspectives on, um, on digital twins. It's not usual for me to give uh, a talk before I've had my first coffee or breakfast. Uh, it's rather earlier here in the UK than it is in, uh, uh, in Dubai. So please bear with me if I'm slightly uh, slower than normal. Um, as I said, it is, it is a great pleasure to be able to give some perspectives on digital twins uh, for climate. Um, I'm involved in uh, the uh, DITO programme that Martin mentioned earlier, and I've got to say thank you to everyone involved in that programme for really making great progress in our thinking uh, around uh, digital twins and digital twins of the ocean. Uh, so a lot of what I'm talking about today will have come through conversations and, uh, and thinking done within that community. So could I have my first slide, please? Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I often start talks uh, about digital twins with this, uh, this European Marine Board description of how you uh, go up the value chain from observations through to public benefit. And I think it's a really nice way of illustrating the importance uh, uh, of digital tools and digital uh, uh, infrastructures for, for, for turning our science and our observations into something that actually has public benefit. Uh, so if you look at the bottom, uh, you have your, your ocean observations, uh, that, that are obviously critical and underpin everything uh, that, 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 that we do uh, in respect to climate and ocean uh, information. Uh, those ocean observations aren't generally all that useful until you convert them in some way into some, uh, some data, and that's often done through models and analyses, and they uh, get used to, to create products and services and so on up the value chain through to, uh, to, to impact and public benefit. Um, and this really underlines that, that, that although we're talking here about digital twins, we've really got to think about the full value chain from those observations through, through these infrastructures to, to the value. Uh, and, and so investing just in the digital elements, of course, is not sufficient. We need to uh, create sustainable uh, investment across that value chain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, if you can just go back one second uh, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the bit with the ditto logo on it. The point I'm just really trying to make here is that uh, digital twins encompass that gap between observations and public benefit and that's, and that's really why we're so excited about how they, they potentially could lead to, to, to value add in, 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 in the ocean and the climate space. They, they allow us more effectively to drag through these observations into public benefit essentially. Uh, next slide please. Uh, 
I was really struck when uh, when working on a paper recently by a paper um, I read. Uh, if you could flip through, sorry, to the to the to the image. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a this is a paper uh, by George et al. This is not a paper by someone from the oceanographic or uh, climate community. It's a paper from uh, the social sciences. And uh, there are two there are two bits I took away from this paper which I'd like to emphasize today. One is uh, the 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 emphasis that society and societal actors are really in a position where they're really ready to take on a, a role in engaging with environment and environment information and they really want to to to, to know what to do next in terms of climate and, and, and so on but then but the next bit the the failure to generate and disseminate disseminate valuable information is 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 a critical reason why they they, they haven't engaged as well as perhaps they should have done and that's and that's i think something we as uh, oceanog oceanographers and people involved in climate uh, climate studies really need to um to, to pay attention to essentially what it's saying is we're not communicating our information our knowledge we're not engaging and putting in, in implementing things that allow our knowledge and data to get into uh, the societal uh, decision uh, uh, processes um, and and georgia tell argue that that's a fundamental cause of the climate crisis i think that's possibly pushing a bit hard but it does give us a sort of clarion call for improving the way that we in, uh, bring our information into, into the public sphere next slide please and, and of course the the, the corollary the the, the that, that what that means is essentially tools like digital twins are, are really important to make sure we can integrate our data and information into that public sphere. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this slide if you can move on to the next one, please. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, uh, a piece of work that uh, we've been doing uh, in the National Oceanography Centre with uh, in collaboration with a number of others. And, and there are really two elements to this slide. Uh, one is uh, regarding uh, 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 a conceptual framework we've been developing, something called the Information Management Framework uh, for Environmental Digital Twins. This conceptual framework is, 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 a, is thinking about how we uh, develop digital twins in a way that is scalable, that is um, able to bring uh, standards and, and processes um, from across the communities, not only the oceanographic community and the climate community, but um, actors in uh, in uh, socio-economic spaces and others together so that we can actually use our digital twins in anger in these in these um, diverse uh, decision spaces. So we, 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 we developed a framework, we published a, a roadmap for trying to bring together the different elements we needed to, to develop digital twins in the environment space. Um, and the argument we made at the time, sorry, could you, uh, apologies for the, for the automatic move on, thank you. The argument we made uh, was that to, to try out uh, some of these uh, framework ideas, you need to develop small scale pilots um, and then to iterate and, and to develop the framework uh, as a result of those pilots. So one of the pilots we have developed is a pilot of a digital twin for a marine protected area, the Hagefras marine protected area, which is in the southwest of the UK. And of course, we, we all know the policy imperative here, we're, 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 we're uh, obliged to protect and and, uh, uh, and therefore observe and understand 30% of the world's ocean uh, uh, and we cannot do that in some way, in any way if we don't actually understand what the what the uh, present uh, uh, ecosystem function is in those uh, environments and therefore how they might change and what the management uh, is uh, what the management processes are doing to improve the, the state of those uh, areas. That, that is very hard to do with traditional observing methods. So we're looking at using imagery, using autonomy, uh, imagery and engaging AI to understand how biodiversity and um, biomass may change in time under those management uh, processes. So that where, a, where a, um, uh, an, uh, uh, an organization who's responsible for an MPA makes changes to the way that they manage those MPAs, they should be able to see how that has had an effect on, on, on the, the health of that environment. And similarly, within the digital twin, therefore, they can then look at management processes for the future and look to see how they might um, uh, might uh, affect the, the, the ecosystem health in that area. Uh, so the idea here is that we're, while testing it in the HAGFRAS MPA, we're developing in a way that is therefore scalable uh, to, to, to roll out to larger, large parts of the ocean. Uh, we do have in development a very fancy video of this, but unfortunately it wasn't ready for now. So you'll have to trust me; it does exist in 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 a in a in a, in a tangible way. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll come to the users in a minute, but um, this was developed very closely with the Joint, Joint Nature Conservation Committee, the JNCC, who manage this MPA. And that's a fundamentally important aspect of Digital Twins, the co-development with users. Next slide, please. John, you have five minutes left, right? Just for your information. Right. Thank you very much. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about some key challenges uh, that I think we need to pay, pay attention to. Uh, uh, when building digital twins, the first and for, what the first one is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, understanding user needs, and Anne has really clearly articulated that. Uh, we we it is hard to understand user needs, especially when you're coming from very different perspectives. But there are communities out there who are much better at doing it uh, than we are, and I think one of the things we learned from the work we did is uh, is how do we bring in new partners and new collaborators that bridge the science we do. Uh, with the work uh, that the users need us to do. And that doesn't mean the science community is not important. We are there to provide the assurance uh, that, the, that the data and the information is valid, but we, but we need to work with other people to make sure it's, it's integrated well. And then the other piece of, um, uh, the other thing that we, we re re really came to understand quite clearly is that when we're talking about digital twins, really users don't care about whether a digital twin is one of the ocean or, uh, or, or any sort of descriptor like that they have a very diverse need for information. So if we're going to build real decision tools, we really need to be working with people across a wide range of different thematic uh, areas. So that will include ocean and maybe atmosphere and so on, but it will also include economic, social um, and so on. So we have to work with a device, diverse community. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the unique things that we, uh, oh, this slide looks very blurry from my perspective. One of the unique things we, we, we also, uh, uh, realised about the about the ocean particularly, but the environment more generally, is this challenge of scale. And this slide demonstrates two two um, separate elements of that. I think one is that particularly under climate time scales, even if working on the local scale, like we are on the in the picture on the right for the for the southwest of the UK, the um, uh, the effects of large scale changes are are, are, are not are, can't be ignored. So the, in the example of the car earlier that Anne showed. Uh, really, a digital twin of the car only relies on information from the car itself uh, or, or the local environment, whereas we rely on information from a very large uh, range of uh, scales. That means we have to be really clear about the fact that we need to interoperate and, and federate our systems. And then the other thing that is clear from these slides is that we really need to scale up how we observe the ocean if we're going to seriously provide decisions based on observations. Um, although we, it looks like we have plenty of observations in the ocean from the left picture, that's really not the case. Uh, at any sort of scale where people care uh, and impact, of course, is at the local scale. So that's where we need the, the information. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, another element is trust um, and trustworthiness. Um, there's a number of elements of trust that are listed here. I won't go through them in detail. Uh, but first, I'll, go, I'll, I'll mention a bit more about, in a minute, the fitness of, for purpose. And then another one I wanted to emphasize is when we get bringing together a number of different uh, uh, types of information and, and compound those into something that's a decision, we have compounding errors. And uh, it's, a, it's a real science challenge to understand how we understand information of quality as it goes through these digital infrastructures when they're, when they're bringing different sources of information together. Uh, so there's a real science challenge there as well as a technological challenge of how do we move that information and, and provide it to the information, uh, provide it to the user in a way that they can understand the, the quality. Next slide, please. John, can you wrap it up now? So we need some time for discussion here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll skip through there. Uh, I, I, had a, I had a funny uh, a, a analogy here, but keep, keep skipping through, I'll go to my conclusions. This was a very funny slide with a great, a, a, a great, uh, a great message, but anyway, we'll ignore it. Uh, and I'll leave my conclusions. Uh, we'll, I'll leave my conclusions up there. Great, Ton. You came across very well, and I think you made very important points. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite uh, now my full panel, and I uh, get the next slide. I think it should be the panel slide. Here we are. So please uh, join up here, Anne. You can come up, Gideon, please, and also Anne Carol Clayson from Woods Hole. And I want to hand. Uh, yep, perfect. I, I'm going to stand here. Oh, no. All right, so we have a wonderful panel here. And I've actually 
very happy, Gideon, to have you here. Should I disclose that we've been postdocs together at Lamont ages ago when we were both kids, right? Uh, so it's too late <laughs> not to. Yeah. And, and, but now you've actually, as uh, being a paleo-oceanographic scientist, uh, the science advisor to government, so you have also a different perspective in the science policy interface. And I, I'd just like to invite you to comment on what you hear. Is that something that resonates with the space that you're also working at? You know it resonates with the scientists, but also with the decision makers. And so anything you can offer a perspective on to this digital twin community and those who are listening here? Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Martin, for the invitation. This is a great pavilion that you people have put together. It's one of the best in the whole uh, enterprise, as, as you said. I'm glad to uh, have a chance to talk on it. Um, I, I want to start by just um, defining what at least I think is important about digital twins. It's quite easy to say, aren't they just models? And I think there are two things that distinguish digital twins from models that are worth accentuating. One of which that you said in your comments, Martin, is that they, in, they imply that we are, we are interacting with the system that we are twinning. And that we, what we're interested in is how do our interactions make a difference. So we saw some lovely examples of that um, from Anne, from, um, Anne and um, John earlier. Um, the other thing that's really critical about digital twins is that they have a very close interaction with the data. And this sort of digital, um, cyber, physical link up I think is, is really important here as well. And we need to recognize both, both of those things. So I really like the fact that, that the efforts that we've seen today and the way you've described it is, is focusing on both of those and also not try to do global all at once, try, try to boil it down to where are the individual problems, local problems, where we need this sort of infrastructure, this digital twinning infrastructure to really, um, to really move our thinking forward. Um, and, and I'll talk just a little bit in a second about how we need to join those together um, I did want to say a couple of things about Ditto, though. Um, I'm lucky enough to be on the UN Decade Advisory Board, and I've always been concerned in that situation that the Decade will just become a, a collection of all the different things that think that they ought to be part of the UN Decade, and the whole will not be some, uh, greater than the sum of the parts. But I think it's programs like Ditto as an absolute flagship that are really doing more and making the UN, UN Decade achieve something by joining things up across a, a great area. So I really thank... Um, I thank you, Martin, and GMR for the leadership there. Um, I, I also um, want to point, point out a couple of things that the UK has done to support uh, digital twins in general. The G7 initiative, the Ocean Decade Navigation Plan, agreed in 21, you um, showed the first two meetings that have really come partly as an outcome of that and as part of UK's support and recognition at a policy level in response to your question about why we need some of these activities. And I. On the data side, finally, before I, I close, uh, data is going to be absolutely critical. All the speakers have talked about that already. Uh, we're going to need um, that as perhaps the biggest challenge to face, as you said, good data formats, good data, uh, metadata, good sharing agreements, and recognizing that these are challenges that are faced well outside the ocean community, and we need to be linking this up in digital twinning efforts much more broadly. And there's some quite big UK policy-facing efforts to think about how we can join up the data and bring together some of our, our twinning across all different domains. But thank you for the session. Thank you very much, Gideon. That was a very helpful perspective. Carol Ann, you were just on another panel just before this one talking about the blue economy. And I think you made a very important point there. I mean, in that other panel, if there are issues, I mean, depending on the flavor of the day, it could be around shipping, it could be around fisheries, it could be a wind capture system, it could also be about marine CDR. So we had some discussion at that panel, and Caroline, you, you sort of made an interesting comment that I enjoyed, that the ocean is a system, you know, we need to be prepared as a system. But in that thinking, where do you see digital twins play a role? What, 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 what would your reaction be, coming from what's sold, an oceanographic institution, hearing the blue economy folks say things? You know, is, is that an opportunity for you? I do. I, I believe that it is. Um, so one of the things that I do is I... I do consulting for various companies, and some of the things that I find very interesting about that, that work is that they are very sophisticated in many ways, um, and, and sophisticated in ways that perhaps we don't think of. So one of the things that was most interesting to me is when I was starting to do some um, predictions for the companies, is that they were very comfortable with the idea of what I give is a plethora, basically a probability distribution function, or essentially, you know, 80% chance of this, 20% chance of this, 10% chance of this, because they think very much in terms of risk, right? 
And so there was a, you know, a lot of discussion about, all right, so what are the options of this happening, which would cause my company to have this problem in the wintertime? And they didn't just need one number. They appreciated seeing sort of that, what we thought of as the distribution of possibilities and, and giving them that information. Some of the digital twinning effect, in fact, gives you the possibility of, of providing that, right? So saying to them, yes, not just this will happen next, you know, next winter. You will have X number, in a particular case, X number of days below a certain degree, right? Um, but what's the, what's the likelihood of that? And so the digital twins, Part of that is that it gives you some of that capability to actually look at that and say, run a number of scenarios and then be saying, here's, here's a distribution of possibilities with some, again, scientific guiding and backing behind that, not just anything might happen, but what is most likely to happen, but what are the odds of some of these other unusual things? Because they were very able to put that into their risk analysis and their cost analysis and say, okay, based on that, we will put, you know, we will, we will put shares into this, and we will put shares into this, and then we will, you know, we will guard against this. Um, and I think that that's one aspect that perhaps I didn't appreciate before really working with industry was that their their sophistication on certain levels that we sometimes think we'll just give them a number. All they want is a number, and that that wasn't true. They want this variety and this capability. Thanks for sharing that perspective. I'm going to open it up now to the audience, and uh, if any of you has a question for any of the speakers, the whole panel, please uh, raise your hand. We have a roving microphone. Many questions. Okay, so can we get the microphone? I think we need to use one of these here. And we have five minutes left, so can be short on your question. We pr I promise we'll be short All on the answers too. All right, so I'm trying to be quick. Jim Edson from Woods Hole Oceanographic. Uh, I, I'm trying to become a fan of digital twins, right? But Getting and it talked about, you know, this is what, how people perceive digital, they're just a model. But let's face it, you need sophisticated earth system model or a high resolution hydrodynamic model with biogeochemical components. The idea, how is that, you know, the idea is to initialize that model with as much data as you possibly can, run case studies, and then look at that with visualization tools. Is that digital twinning or is there something more to it than that? I think you almost got it right. There's one important step, I think Anne mentioned to that, and the step is intervention optimization, right? So what Carol showed you is an example of where you want to take out the causeway, yes, no. That's the twinning thing. In ocean forecasting, we're looking at the environment, what comes your way, you know, by storm surges, things like that. That's a forecast. But in twinning, you want to know if I act, is my action going to have a positive outcome or a negative outcome? So is my intervention optimal or should I do something else, right? Exactly. But that's so, okay. So exactly. That's, and so that's in exactly a, what they're in, in engineering terms, I think what we're actually talking about, to be honest, is a digital shadow here, which is, a, I don't know how much you've read the literature on this sort of stuff, but there is a, there's a technical difference, and really a digital twin is one where the data and the, and the physical um, world and the model are so intertwined that, you, that it's happening in real time, and you can adjust. Imagine what happens if you flick a switch to the whole system um, in real time. Um, that's not quite where we're getting with environmental digital twins. Um, but we're definitely going a step further than we are with models that we've um, developed up to this point in the fact that the, the, the close interaction with the data, um, the ability to really test out in detail specific questions about what it is you want to try and intervene to solve and then to look at future scenarios, I think is, is a step um, towards that digital twin model that takes us beyond simple models we've used so far. Can I, can I just can add to that? Make a comment? Yeah, please. May I? Hi, Jim. That was a great question, and I'm dying to answer it. So everyone in this room has a weather app on their phone. And weather is, the weather predictions are models, right, that are simulating data and getting better at predicting the future closer to the time. They're models. But everybody has that on their phone. How many people in this room or at this conference or in this world have your ocean model on their phone and are using it to plan their day, to plan their coral reef management, to plan shipping distribution lanes, to plan a railway, to plan. How many people 
are using our ocean models for that. Yeah, that's one way. Tell me. Yeah. In the scientific community, they are, but I will say that nobody has that on their phone yeah. in the f in the equivalent of a weather app. Yeah. Okay, and we need gonna, to do that. We're going to go to the next question. Great conversation. You can have a follow on on that. I just want to say there is shadows and twins. The twin that I know of is managing a Mari culture system, where the data come in and actually make decisions on the spot. So it's a real twin That's a good in Mari culture, but many of them are shadows. But I want you to ask the next I question. Think, I think John wants to say something on. Oh. The well, I, I want to go to the next question. Sorry, John. We, we need to manage time here. So many questions here. John, you get the answer in a moment. Yes. No, no, go, 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 go. You go and then. Islamos Mon from CAST. So, a great talk, by the way. Uh, just wondering what kind of technology we need to make a digital twin for global coral reef? Because it seems like. Until recently, we didn't have a, a, a detailed map for distribution of coral reef. Now we are adding a layer of optimization and too many different data that required to make digital twin. Is it uh, we needed? What kind of technology we need to make it globally accessible? Yeah, let's do two questions. Take your question too, because this man has to go in like in one minute. Thank you. Um, mine's kind of related. I'm curious about all these excellent technologies and. You made really great points about sharing the information. It's one thing to have it, but you need to share it and educate the others. So in terms of getting it out, is it a subscription model? Is it going to be open to everyone? Um, and then in terms of just sharing the information, we also need to story tell and convince. You know, we can't just share different data points. Um, so how do you get it to the decision makers? Um, that's my question. Yeah. Thanks. Two quick answers, Anne and John. Anne? You both raised the perfect points, and the whole reason that we built the digital twin was to put the data, the information, the decision-making tools in the hands of those folks on the ground. It's no point having it in our magnificent scientific institutions where we do tremendous science and make tremendous discoveries. We have to put it in the hands of the, of the decision makers, and that's why we've built a digital twin that's really accessible, really intuitive, click of a mouse, using gaming engine platforms. Because we watch our kids play video games and that's how they learn. To scale, we, we are building a prototype. And the goal of the prototype is to be transferable to different coral reef ecosystems. As Jim says, the fundamental, the base layer of the coral reef digital twin is a high resolution physics model. So we need high resolution physics models for every single coral reef ecosystem for which you want to build a digital twin. That's where the real work is, and that's where we're going to need to bring AI into our development strategy. Thank you. And John, you want to add to that? Yeah, very briefly, there are two elements to your question, I think. The first is um, how do we engage the users and make sure that they're actually using it. Um, so sharing is fundamentally about making sure the users get what they need to answer their decisions. Uh, and I think that's where the, the previous question about models uh, comes in. If you don't give the users what they're actually asking for, if you develop a large scale model, for example, but it's not actually integrated with what they use, you're not developing a digital twin, you're developing a model. If you're developing right. a model that can actually pass information, that's really important. But the other element of that, there are technological challenges around interoperability and, and ontologies and everything that are really key to making sure that everything is shareable at scale. Thank you very Sorry, much, John. Um, we need to wrap up here, unfortunately. So I want to thank my great panel here for bringing closer to you what digital twins are, what the possibilities are about digital twin. We discussed the challenges. You are free to talk to the experts afterward using a coffee, but we have to wrap on here on time. So thanks to the Ocean Pavilion, thanks to the panel, and join me in giving them a big round of applause.